Sergeant Bergdahl, a traitor, who, by the way, six people, at least, that we know of, six people were killed trying to get this guy back. Six people. They went after him. They wanted to get him back. So we get Sergeant Bergdahl, and they get five people that they desperately wanted for years that are right now back on the battlefield. As evidence begins to emerge about the disappearance and reacquisition of Army PFC Bo Bergdahl, we're learning more than just what he did, but why he disappeared from his post and vanished into the Afghanistan night. And while plenty of people still want him hung literally and figuratively for his actions, there may be solid reasons why he did what he did, forged in a very difficult past. Our guest is the veteran national security writer for the Washington Post, also anchor at their military blog, Checkpoint. Welcome Dan Lamoth to the Hardline. Dan, after reading your articles and looking a little bit deeper into what's involved here, we hear people like Donald Trump and many others using the words traitor. But are we finding out if we put Bergdahl's past into it that maybe that was too quick a knee jerk to call him a traitor? I mean, I, if you're going to say he was defecting to the Taliban, I don't know that we have that right now. What we have is that he walked away uh, with a very troubled past, uh, wanted to draw attention, wanted to cause chaos to grab the attention of a general so that he could air grievances that he, he had with his unit and his, with his leadership. What about this, and Major General Kenneth Dahl is the one who did the investigation, and he talked about this unconventional upbringing that he said, quote, near the edge of the grid. What is it about Bergdahl's past that leads us to believe, and let's not forget while we're talking about his past, that maybe medically speaking, he should not have been in the Army in his first place. Uh, but tell us a little bit about some of these things that could have led to it. There's a, there's a couple pieces at play here. One, um, and it, this part has been reported previously, but he had washed out of the Coast Guard a couple years prior in a matter of weeks. Um, and during the hearing last week, one of the things that we heard for the first time was a bit more detail on that. Um, Bergdahl was found sitting on a barracks floor with his hands covered in his own blood um, and was hospitalized for a period of time and, and then ultim ultimately released from du duty and released back into civilian life. He joined the Army a couple years after that with a waiver. So you can certainly raise the question about whether or not he was fit to serve in the first place. Well, um, let's bring that up for a second here, because if you look at a lot of this, this was not a mentally stable individual, and in many ways, the Army itself, the military, sh should they not have caught this when they allowed this guy to join? I think it's fair to ask how, how he got the waiver. Um, there was a lot of pressure to find new, new recruits at that point. I mean, you're talking the back end of the Iraq, Iraq War, and as we were really starting to push into Afghanistan. So, I mean, th there was a definite need for recruits. There was a lot of waivers, and there's been a lot of scrutiny of where waivers were given across the services in general. When we talk about what he did and why he did it, he was talking about, and you alluded to this a little bit, that he was trying to stay away from the Army for a day, maybe two, and then go 19 miles to a different installation and then demand to air grievances with a general. Doesn't this in itself tell us that a guy who thinks he's going to be in enemy territory and walk 19 miles away in enemy-infested territory, that he's just not right to begin with here? Uh, I, a couple things of note there. Uh, one, this is all things that Bergdahl told General Dahl in an interview last year, many of which came to light just for the first time last week. Um, we're still parsing out what Bergdahl says he did and why he did it versus what actually happened. So I think that's important to note. Um, with that said, his plan was to walk away from his base with a disguise um, and, and walk to the larger base 20 miles away where, where his battalion leadership and, and others would have been. Um, he wa walked away around midnight, supposedly, uh, the night of June 29th, 2009, uh, and was supposedly uh, captured within a matter of 12 hours. So that, th those are all additional details we didn't have before. Dan, let's look at the other side of this, too. We have to cover both sides. Is it not possible? And I know neither one of us are, are psychological doctors here. We don't know every single instance. But in what you've been able to uncover and what we've learned, is it not just possible that this is a guy who is just seeking excuses at this point, and he may indeed be a traitor? I, I think one thing that still needs to be hashed out in greater detail is what Bergdahl's saying versus what the intelligence that much of it is still classified as saying. Um, I do think it's fair to question that at this point. Um, with that said, uh, General Dahl, who is a highly respected two-star officer, um, said that he found Ber Bergdahl credible based on months, uh, months worth of investigation last year. So, so I, th I think it's notable that um, General Dahl himself 
is saying, I find him to be truthful in, in terms of, you know, the, the rationale, as crazy as you may or may not think it is, um, for what he did. Now we have also the lawyer for Bergdahl is asking the military court to publicly release the transcript of the interview with the military officials, a summary of the investigation. Now this is not out yet. Is there any hint whatsoever? Sources you talk to, people telling us what may be in it, I guess, what maybe that smoking gun may be to give us a little bit more of an insight into Bergdahl? I mean, really, all we have uh, in terms of the, the specifics of the investigation now uh, are, are what General Dahl said last week. So, I mean, r really a characterization of the two days that he spent with uh, Sergeant Bergdahl last year. Um, and, and then just the other pieces around it. I mean, all of the all of the details about the chaos that was caused, you know, the, these extensive searches, you know, the, the, the members of his company and battalion and re really that that whole region of Afghanistan turning operations on their head to try and find him. Do you get the sense of what the general said? He said, unrealistically, idealistic Bergdahl does not deserve jail sentence. Do you think that will carry any weight at all? I think it will carry some weight. I think the question will be, the, I think the sentence in many ways becomes the most interesting piece to this. Um, most people that have been tracking this case find that the odds of a court martial are extremely likely. The, the question becomes, at that point, if they move forward and if a conviction occurs, there's such a wide range of sentences that are available, mm -hmm. ranging from life all the way down to time served. We so, invite you to go to Washington Post. Also go to the Washington Post blog, Checkpoint. That's where Dan Lamoth writes, and you'll, be, you'll keep up on this as we will as well. Dan, a pleasure. Thanks so much for joining us. Stay with us. The Hard Line, the fastest 60 minutes of news continues.